ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. When Zoya Patel was 10, she developed an all-consuming obsession, one that would go on to devour a lot of money and a lot of time. It started one afternoon while Zoya was watching the telly. And The Saddle Club came on, a TV series about three best friends who share a love of horse riding. Zoya was transfixed and she began begging her parents for horse riding lessons. Her family had migrated to Australia from Fiji. They were raising four kids and trying to run a motel, so money was tight. But Zoya's mum eventually gave in, thinking that her youngest child's horse mania would fizzle out in a few months. Well, two decades later, Zoya is still riding horses. And horses have helped her through a lot, including a period of estrangement from her parents, which happened after Zoya fell in love with a non-Indian, non-Muslim man and secretly moved in with him. Zoya Patel is a writer. She's written a memoir called No Country Woman, as well as a novel called Once a Stranger. And Zoya has a new YA novel for horse lovers called Two Hearts. Hi, Zoya. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. As I say, you were born in Fiji. Do you have any memories at all of your of your life there before you came to Australia? I have some very vague memories, and they're the type of memory where you wonder if it's a true memory or if someone told me a story, and I kind of have the vision in my head. But I do have one memory of being in a house and this strange man coming in and giving me a teddy bear. And it wasn't for years until I realised that that's actually my dad and he was coming back from scouting out Australia as our new home. Well, what what brought them here? Why did they want to leave Fiji for Australia? I actually only found out the full story of this myself recently while talking to my dad. And I didn't realise, but at the time that we were moving, which was the early 90s, there was quite a lot of political unrest in Fiji. And then on top of that, the family itself had had a few experiences of violent crime. So my dad had been assaulted while giving a stranger a lift one night. um, And then my uncle had also had his store robbed and had been assaulted in that process. And so my parents were already at the point with four young children that they were thinking, is this really where we want to raise them? And both of them had studied in Auckland. They went to university together and that's where they met. So dad started kind of looking into opportunities either to go to Australia or New Zealand. So he found a job and next thing we knew it, literally within weeks, we were packed up and moving to Albury, New South Wales. To Albury. So what job had your dad found? So dad's an electrical engineer and he got a job with a company that back then was called Murray River Electricity. So he was actually the first non-white engineer to be employed by the company, apparently. So we called Aubrey home for about six years. So what are your memories of country New South Wales? How, how did that work for, for you and your siblings and your mum and dad? It's funny. It's actually quite a contradictory experience in the sense that I think there were kind of two sides of our life in Albury. One was very idyllic. So when we got to Albury, my dad decided that he wanted to make sure that we had other people in our lives who had similar experiences. And as a devout Muslim, he wanted to see if there was a Muslim community. So he literally got a phone book out and looked up every Muslim name and just started cold calling people. (laughs) Are you serious? I'm not. My dad's quite a character. (laughs) And how did that go? Like, was it, was he correct in assuming that these names were, belonged to, to Muslim people? Yeah, he was. And he invited everyone to a picnic um, at the local Noriel Park. And this big group of people from completely different backgrounds, we had, you know, friends who were from Lebanon, from Bosnia, from Malaysia, from India, even from Fiji as well. Everybody came together and formed a bit of a community. So all of our families happened to have young children of similar ages. So we just ended up with this amazing community and That was this really idyllic, wonderful Mm. part of our lives. You know, big picnics, big gatherings at Eid and Ramadan. All the women from all these different countries would share recipes and teach each other how to cook different delicacies. And it was absolutely wonderful. But I guess the flip side of that was that the more mainstream community in Albury, which, you know, was predominantly very white Australian, didn't always have a welcoming attitude to migrants. They did and they didn't. We had wonderful friends from my parents' workplaces. Both my parents had made really great connections through work. But when we went to school, we faced a fair amount of racist bullying from other kids in school. So it was a little bit of that light and shade. 
Was there a halal butcher in Albury back then? There was not. But again, my dad is quite industrious and he just visited farmers um, around the place and brokered these connections. And we did a combination of dad going to these properties and slaughtering animals for us. And then also we would do these trips up to Sydney or Melbourne where there were halal butchers and buy a huge amount of meat. And then we had a chest freezer where everything was stored. So what's involved in slaughtering an animal in the halal way, Zoya? Well, I can tell you that my knowledge of this is the reason why I've been a strict vegetarian and (laughs) vegan for most of my life. Um, It's primarily about following the rites of Islam. So there's a prayer that said um, animals are given a final drink of water and some food. And then after their throat is slit, so the death should be quite quick because it's one cut through the jugular, their blood is drained. And I think that's kind of one of the primary aspects that differs from other slaughter practices. But my dad would do this with um, chooks and small chooks and ducks um, in our backyard. And I remember from the very beginning saying, I absolutely do not want to eat that animal. I thought it was a pet. So um, I was clearly very affected by that. So religion was obviously a big part of your, your parents' lives. How else did they keep you and your siblings in touch with Fijian Indian and, and Islamic traditions at home? We always had a very close-knit family, and I think that's because we were in this foreign country. So I have three siblings. I'm the youngest of four. And our house was very much this kind of, it was a warm and inviting place, and things like prayer were made fun for us. So evening prayers that we would do together were always full of, you know, laughter and giggling, and dad would make it interesting for us and tell us the stories. And so I think it was Religion was kind of fundamentally woven throughout all of the aspects of our lives. And then, of course, there was this broader community that we were part of. I think through that kind of combination, we had quite a close connection to our culture while still having parents who wanted to make the best of our opportunities in Australia. So we got to know Albury and we got to know the surrounding country, New South Wales towns really well as well. Pretty much most weekends we'd jump in the car and drive to another town and explore. So I'm talking about places like Orange and Beechworth and, you know, Juni, all these little towns that are nearby. And if we weren't doing that, then my parents would get the paper on a weekend, circle all the garage sales (laughs) um, and would drive around to every garage sale because, you know, we came over with not a lot of money and everything we owned was secondhand. And that was actually a really fun thing Mm. that we did together. What expectations were there on you and your siblings for school when it came to to schoolwork and academic work? I've always felt like my parents were perhaps a little bit different to others in their kind of cohort of their generation when it came to school. A lot of our Indian peers had more strict expectations around the type of study that they would do, the type of results they would get in school. Whereas my parents wanted us to do well academically, but there wasn't that same pressure. I think they wanted us to have as many opportunities as possible. So they didn't kind of restrict us to what they considered to be good careers or, you know, any kind of push to excel in a particular subject, which I really loved. They they wanted us to enjoy it. And my dad, when he would drop us off at school, and my mum too, the only things that they would say to us were be good and be kind. Hmm. And I think they just wanted us to have be good people and have good lives. So school was important. um, And they did have four kids who all did quite well at school, which maybe made it a little bit easier to have that more relaxed attitude. But I think they really wanted us to have as broad um, an idea of the opportunities available to us as possible. Your family moved from Albury to Canberra. Was that a different kind of environment to be a Fijian Australian in? How How did Canberra fit? It's so funny because... Now I look at it and it's funny the idea that I had about us as a result of being in Albury. So when we were in Albury, we were the only brown kids at my school. And as much as that resulted in a bit of bullying and um, definitely some racist experiences, it also made me feel like we were a little bit special. So when I came to school in Canberra and I went to a school that's located right near all of the embassies, so we had a really high cohort of, you know, multiculturalism and diplomats' children um, at the school. And I remember my first day being like, well, hang on a second, <laughs> I, I'm not the only person here. Like I honestly felt a little bit deflated <laughs> because I wasn't special anymore. But it was also wonderful because suddenly we weren't, you know, sticking out to other people and... We had a mosque in Canberra, which we'd never had access to. There was a halal butcher. 
And yeah, whilst it was really hard to leave the tight knit community that we had in Albury, at the same time, suddenly we had this much, much bigger Muslim community and a lot more connection to other Fijian Australians who also had settled in the area. So I think it was quite a mental shift, but definitely opened up Australia even more to us. So as you moved into your teenage years, Zoya, were you a rebellious kind of kid? You know, Compared to other people's ideas of rebellion, I think I was actually like a model child. I remember a lot of my friends' parents would say, you are like the ideal child because I was quite a self-starter at school. I did really well at school. I had no interest in typical teenage rebellions. So, you know, I wasn't a kid who wanted to party and drink or try drugs or do anything kind of out there. But in the context of my family, I guess I was rebellious because the things that I was interested in and the things that I wanted to do, which were often just, you know, classic counterculture. So indie alternative music and like punk aesthetics and reading Japanese comic books and those types of things were just so alien to FAG and Indian (laughs) parents who were a bit like, what on earth is this? Um, So I think they saw me as more rebellious than I think an Australian mainstream kind of family would have seen me because the things that I was attracted to were just like way outside the realm of their experience. You were into writing from a young age, loved writing, loved reading. What did your parents think about that? That was very strongly encouraged. So I don't think my parents quite understood why or where it came from, but we are a big family of readers. So my siblings were also reading voraciously and, you know, we would pass books between us. We couldn't afford to buy new books very often. So we would typically pick up, you know, boxes of secondhand books from garage sales and frequently attend our libraries. And even though there was a range of ages amongst me and my siblings, we would all read everything. And I think as a result of that, I was reading quite ahead of my age group without really realizing that that was the case. So I started writing pretty much as soon as I understood how to write. In fact, before I could write, I was picking up pieces of paper and scribbling on them, (laughs) pretending I was writing. And my parents would just buy me exercise books and I'd fill them with stories and then they'd buy me another exercise book and we'd keep doing that until we got to Canberra where the local paper actually had a section where children could write stories or poetry and send in illustrations and get those published. So my dad would send in my poetry and it would get published and I'd get a $5 Collins book voucher in return and he would clip another $5 onto there for me. And they just really encouraged me to keep that love of writing alive and see where it took me. How did your dad go about introducing you to other older professional writers, Zoya? Well, I have wonderful memories of my dad just popping me in the car as a 10-year-old and taking me to the ACT Writers' Centre to their Writers' Festival. And I look back on it and it's actually, um, it's very sweet. I find it quite charming because, you know, he wasn't a typical attendee for these types of festivals. He wasn't a writer himself, but he would take me to the events and sit me down and we'd listen to local authors, you know, sharing their craft and talking about their methodology. And then he would wait until the event was over and take me up and introduce me to them and say, this is my daughter. She's a writer. I look back at it now and I'm like, I love that he thought that his 10-year-old child was kind of (laughs) as valid a writer as these published authors that he was introducing me to. But it did open my eyes up to this idea that writers weren't this other breed. You know, they weren't kind of too amazing and too lofty for me to even imagine myself as being one of their peers. They were just ordinary people. And I think that actually really changed the way that I thought about my own writing and what Mm. I could potentially achieve. It's an amazing gift of of validation or of confidence that he he gave to you as well. Yeah, I think um, it speaks a lot to his character, which is, in fact, both my parents, they have never felt, I guess, cowed by their difference, um, even when both of them have had experiences that could have made them feel really alienated in this country. Instead, they've always kind of encouraged us to feel like we're just as capable of, you know, achieving our dreams. And it's just as valid for us to be in different spaces as anyone else. And I think that psyche has definitely helped all of us as their children to kind of, I guess, like reconcile some of those negative experiences that we've had with all of the positives that we have as as Australians and to really take on that Australian identity. So growing up, there's family and there's books and there's writing. How did horses enter the picture? I think I was always fascinated by horses as a big animal lover. So 
from as little as I can remember, I was obsessed with all animals. I mean, at the point at which I got into horses, we were living in the motel that my parents owned and there was no room for a pet, but I I begged to get a goldfish because I just wanted something um, (laughs) to take care of. And I can still remember the afternoon after school when we turned on the TV and Saddle Club was on. And this was the Australian production based on the Canadian Australian novels. So it felt really, I guess, kind of relatable to watch these three girls who are about my age at the time and their best friends and they're riding horses. And I was just captivated. My parents were actually away at the time. I remember they were traveling. So we had a family friend taking care of us. And I waited and waited until they got home. And the first thing I said to my mum was, please, can I go horse riding? There's, and I knew at the time my school bus went past this route where there's a sign up saying riding school, horse riding school. And so I was like, there's a horse riding school in Canberra. I had no idea at the time that Canberra actually has the highest ratio of horses per capita of any Australian city. Um, so there were there were many riding schools in town, but I just begged her to drive down that road. How did she react? What was her response? Probably with dismay, because unlike my siblings who had taken on more kind of normal hobbies for children and low-cost hobbies like team sport, I had shown no interest in any kind of team sport or athletics or anything like that. Literally, my hobby was stamp collecting. Um, (laughs) And then suddenly I wanted to do this really intense, involved and expensive hobby. So I think her initial reaction was, I'll have to talk to your father while she tried to figure out what we would do. And then I remember hearing them having this conversation in the kitchen. They didn't realise I was listening. And my mum was saying, look, I know it's expensive, but she's only going to do this for a few months. You know, it's just a phase. She'll get over it. (laughs) So she finally agreed and they supported you in doing this strange thing of, of horse riding. What do you remember about your first lesson? I remember rocking up and thinking I was dressed in the right clothing. But of course, what we'd done was tried to find an approximation of what we thought horse riding clothes were. So we'd literally gone to like Big W and picked up boots that we thought looked like horse riding boots. And the first thing that happened was the instructor saying to me, those aren't actually safe to ride in because they had treads on the bottom and horse riding boots don't have treads on the bottom. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, there is a lot that I don't know about this. But that first ride, I didn't care. They could have told me anything and I would have been okay with it. As soon as I got on the horse, I just felt, you know, absolute elation. Elation? Why? I can't explain it. I think a lot of people who are equestrians will get this, but there's there's something really special about the feeling of connecting with the animal. You know, we're guiding them through a language that has been developed over so long. And, you know, as a kid, I remember thinking, how is it that this horse knows that when I, you know, touch her with my leg on this side, she goes that way, or I I squeeze my rein on this side, she goes the other way. And at that time, I had barely any idea what I was doing. But the idea that I could be on this animal and we could be moving as one was just so exciting to me. The, The biggest animals that most kids would have much experience with, what about the size, the physicality of a horse, particularly when you were young? I don't know where it came from, but I have never had any fear of any animal. Like I've always, from as little as I can remember, um, you know, dogs, cats, whatever, big animals, small animals, farm animals, I would just go up to things. I would pick up pigeons and hold them. You know, I just always had this love of animals and horses never scared me. They still never scare me, no matter how big they are. And I've had a lot of falls off my first horse. Um, And people would say, how do you just keep getting back on? And I just, I just always loved them. And it never occurred to me to be worried the way that other people get worried about horses. I still find it so strange when, you know, I'll take my partner out to the horses. He's good with them, but he still, you know, gives them a wide berth, um, particularly (laughs) the back end. And I always find it so funny because equestrians will say to you, we just go up and hug their bums. You know, we don't even think about (laughs) getting kicked. It doesn't bother us. They're a very reassuring smell, horses, even if their size can be off-putting for some of us. There's something very, I don't know, soothing and earthy about the smell and the the heat of a horse. They are comforting, I think. I think the sad thing about being an equestrian is you stop noticing the smell after a while (laughs) and people will get into my car and say, oh, it smells like horses. And I'm like, really? I can't tell. Um, But yeah, you know, you spend that much time surrounded by hay and that warm, snuffly kind of feeling that horses have and you just kind of imbibe it in a way. I definitely feel 
very comforted when I'm with my horses. So the animals straight away were something that you loved and wanted to be around. What about the other girls who were into horse riding? How did, how did you get on with them? You know, I think back to the saddle club sometimes and there was always this binary in, in any kind of horse show or horse book between the, the main characters and then some kind of like snobby counterpart who epitomises what people think of as the horse girl. So, you know, private school educated, dressed in the really toffee kind of clothing and a little bit elitist. And unfortunately, that stereotype can ring true. Um, and I experienced that firsthand. So whilst I loved the horses, I was in this situation where all of the kids that I was dealing with at the riding centre that I went to were not super friendly. They had really established social groups of their own and I was definitely on the outer. And once again, I was one of the only brown people around and, you know, I didn't have the horse rider physique and I definitely didn't have the clothes, which is a big thing because my parents couldn't afford to go buy me the best riding clothes, you know. I was riding in tights um, and then eventually I got one or two pairs of, of riding pants and I never quite fit in and there was some active bullying as well. So it got to the point where every time I was going horse riding, it was this active decision to kind of put up with the negatives so that I could have the positive of just that half an hour on a horse. When did it get to a point when you decided it, it wasn't worth the, the social stuff that was going on? Even with your love of horses, you decided to step away. I spent quite a few years, I think it was two or three years, um, working as a volunteer junior staff member at this riding centre. They would pay us in a ride on a horse at the end, but it was the the most tricky horses. So you'd get on the crazy ones um, as your payment for mucking out stables all day. But every day that I would do this, I'd be going out and kind of dealing with this little cohort of, of other girls who just made my life hell. And in a way that was really kind of insidious and low level. So I never felt like I should tell someone about it. Like my parents had no idea, but it was just a constant kind of ribbing or, you know, if I got to ride a a particularly nice horse, they'd all be like, why does she get to ride that horse? You know, she's not even that good, that kind of thing. And I must have just been building up without me even realizing how anxious it was making me because one day I went for my lesson and one of the girls made some kind of narky remark and I literally, I walked back to the car and got in and I said to mum, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, And that weekend I listed everything that I owned for horse riding. So my helmet and my boots and my clothes, and I put them all in the classifieds and sold them. And I didn't ride again for almost a decade. Gosh, that's a heartbreaking thing to have to feel you had to do. Did it feel heartbreaking at the time? It was both heartbreaking on one level, but it also felt like maybe it was time because at that point I was kind of 16, 17 years old and everybody else who had had a horsey phase had either moved on or they were in a position where their parents had bought them a horse so they were like embedded in that community. Whereas for me to keep doing lessons suddenly felt, you know, is this a bit immature? Should I be moving on anyway? And I was starting to get really interested in other things. So, you know, music and live music and art and I guess I was in this period of growth as a teenager. So it almost felt like just saying goodbye to a piece of my childhood. I definitely grieved it, but I had so many other things that I was, you know, getting into that it it felt like a natural kind of shift. Where did you first set eyes on Chris, the man who would become your partner? I was in university at the time um, and he was also at the same university and I was volunteering for a student journalism group that were kind of running for the editorship of our student newspaper. And one of these people knew Chris and we were in this meeting room and I just remember looking up and seeing him walk in and he was this, you know, scruffy haired musician with skinny leg jeans and very 2009, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Um, And I looked at him and I turned around to my friend and I just said, dibs. Um, (laughs) And, you know, we were friends for years before anything happened. But um, (laughs) So what did you have in common when you first met? Because on the surface, it might look like you were different kinds of people. What did you have in common? We both loved music and I think that was the initial connection. The editor at the time actually set us up to write an article together about Splendour in the Grass and that's how we first kind of started hanging out. It's not until um, we'd been together for a while that I realised that all the music that I love, Chris actually classified as indie landfill and didn't enjoy 
but he's a nice person. So he would chat to me about the bands that I thought were awesome, even though he was listening to totally different stuff. Um, and he was in a band. So I did a lot of um, music reviewing and interviewing for our local street press. And I started reviewing gigs that he was playing and we'd just kind of circle around each other in that way and then discovered that we were both very politically engaged. So we'd have long debates about feminism and, you know, race relations and kind of classic, slightly pretentious things that people in their early 20s who are studying arts degrees um, like to talk about. So we ended up having a lot more in common than I probably would have thought. How much did you tell him about your family or or what did you tell him about your family and and what your mum and dad's expectations of you were? I think from as early as I can remember, from kind of a teenager onwards, I felt quite embarrassed about the expectations of my family. Not because, you know, as an adult, I can look back and say they weren't unyielding in their expectations, but at the time it felt really overprotective and very uncool that my parents didn't want us to date, Um, you know, that we weren't allowed to kind of go out past a certain point at night and they were quite protective and the expectation was that we would have arranged marriages. And that was so normal in my community, but so abnormal in the kind of society that I was in. I didn't have any other friends who were in a similar situation as me. So I actually told Chris very little until we started dating and then, you know, I had to tell him everything. And I remember just being very nervous, explaining to him that I wouldn't be telling my parents about him until I felt sure that it was serious and that there were things that I just wouldn't be able to do until they knew about us and that that could really go either way as well. I didn't know how they would react. Podcast, broadcast. This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. You say that the expectation in your family was that you would have an arranged marriage. What conversation did you have with your mum and dad to say how you felt about that? I think my parents were maybe a little bit different to others in the sense that An arranged marriage in our context isn't that your parents just pick someone and you have to marry them. It was more that, you know, you would know who you could choose from. So there'd be like a smaller pool of suitable suitors who, you know, came from the right families, shared our religion, shared our culture. And then that relationship would be brokered by your families. So you had a little bit more choice than I think people expected, but it was still certainly arranged. And I knew from the very beginning that that was not something that I wanted for a couple of reasons. And I think the main one was that I was just an ardent feminist and the relationships that I saw around me, you know, Fiji and Indian Muslims who were married had very kind of patriarchal gender roles and it just chafed against me. So pretty early on around when I was 18, I sat my parents down and I told them, look, A, I'm not sure that I believe in Islam and that was really hard for them to kind of grasp. Um, and B, I, I don't want to have an arranged marriage. And interestingly, they accepted that second one really quickly. They were like, yep, okay, that's fine. No one's going to force you. But the expectation then was that I would live with them. Nobody ever moved out without getting married in my family. Okay, so you don't have to get married, but then you have to stay with us forever. Yeah, just be a spinster forever, um, I think was the, <laughs> the solution. <laughs> so that sounds like such a clash of worlds, Zoya. On the one hand, you've got this family very clear on their expectations of you, a loving family, but with these clear expectations. And then you've met this skinny leg jeaned guy who you're really into and uh, are starting a romance with. How did you hold both of those realities? What did that mean for you stuck in the middle? Um, I would say I held them badly. I think my mental health was the worst that it had ever been. And by this point, I had kind of helped 
guide my parents along and we'd had enough conversations that I was living out of home. And that was a really big deal, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I think it shows a lot about my parents' willingness to adapt. You know, they were doing all of this for the first time too. They'd never raised kids in another country. And so I'd already kind of started pushing those boundaries. But it meant that I felt like I was living a double life all the time. You know, I had this secret boyfriend and I was living this life that was much more kind of mainstream Australian in the share house with my friends at university, looking to all intents and purposes, like just a normal Australian young person. But then I'd go home and I was carrying the weight of this secret and it just really tore me up. I wasn't sleeping. I would cry a lot. Chris was trying to figure out how he could best support me. Um, without putting any pressure on. And, you know, I have to give him credit where credit is due because that's a lot for a a 21-year-old to kind of take on. But I think the two of us knew that we were serious about each other pretty early on. So it was really a case of me knowing that I had to have this really hard conversation with my parents and just not knowing how to start it and feeling like I was lying to them all the time because I was holding that secret inside and, you know, they had no idea. So how did you finally have that conversation? How did you go about it? What did you know to say? I did not know what to say. So I did what a good millennial would do and I emailed them. (laughs) I, I just did not, I would sit there in front of my parents and, you know, try and build it up and I just could never do it. So I reached a point where I was living in Melbourne. So I was quite far away from them as it was. And Chris and I were doing long distance. So he was intending to move to Melbourne And we wanted to live together. So there was no way that I could keep that a secret. So I eventually just wrote everything down um, in a big, long email. And I emailed them both. And then I texted both my parents and said, I've just sent you an email. And then I turned my phone off. Just could not (laughs) handle the anticipation of of what the response would be. And I was a wreck, you know. Mm. Um, I did it on a weekend where Chris was visiting so that I knew that I wouldn't be alone. Um, what were you scared of? Did you think they would what reject you? Or, or I really thought they would disown me. And that was kind of what had happened to other people who had done similar things. You know, like I'd grown up seeing other women like me who'd grown up in Australia but had these expectations. If they wanted to step away from that, if they wanted to not have the arranged marriage or be with somebody from a different culture, they were typically just cast out of the family altogether. And you wouldn't see these girls again. They were just cut out from the community that's what I expected to you happen thought, to me. You thought those loving parents of yours might do that? Yeah. And to be fair to my parents, it's really, really hard to reconcile that your child is going to live a life that's completely at odds with everything that you think is going to keep them, you know, protected and safe and happy. And I think also the religious part was a big thing because it took me a while to understand this. But if you genuinely believe that by not being with a Muslim person, you're going to hell, then imagine the parents' kind of anxiety about their child being condemned to eternal damnation, you know, because they've made this decision. And in Islam, it's a parent's responsibility to make sure that your children do have a religious marriage to another Muslim and that they raise their children as Muslims. So I think knowing all of this and knowing how big the stakes were for my family, I couldn't see how they could accept me and Chris. And it definitely was a really, really challenging thing for them to kind of wrap their heads around. So when you when you plucked up the courage to turn your phone back on, Zoya, after sending that email, what was there? I had a bunch of missed calls from my dad. And as I turned my phone on, he called me again and I answered it and I just burst into tears. And I remember dad saying, don't cry. It's okay. Like, we will figure this out. So, you know, his first impulse was to just reassure me. Um, what was and their I mean, solution, Zoya? Their idea of figuring it out was still very different from my idea of figuring it out. I think, you know, the the normal thing to do in this situation and if you wanted to try and make it work was for Chris to convert and for us to be married and that would have been the only acceptable way for us to live together. Did you and Chris discuss that? Did you consider it like, oh, bugger it, we'll just have the ceremony? We did and I think at first we thought, well, that's not so hard. You know, neither of us really believe in it. So who cares? It's just, it's just words. But then we started thinking about it a bit more. And I think two things kind of struck us. One was that it's really disrespectful to my family to pretend and to do this while knowing that we were kind of lying and making it up. And that didn't feel right. But then on top of that was this sense of, well, if we do this, what expectations will they be? You know, will we be expected to 
join in to, you know, Muslim events and Muslim practices when we're around my family? What if we have children? Will they expect us to raise them as Muslim? Interestingly, the thing that didn't bother us was the idea of of committing to being together forever because we'd already made that commitment. Um, But the idea of kind of setting up these false expectations and then having to negotiate each new thing as it happened, I think we both realised that the only way forward was to be honest from the from the get-go and explain to my parents that it just wasn't something that we could do in good faith. So once your mum and dad heard that that decision from you that it wasn't going to be solved, in inverted commas, by getting married and, and Chris converting to Islam, what happened between you and your family? Where did that leave things? I think it was kind of one of those things where for a while we tried to find some other way um, of making it work. And I think perhaps, I, you know, I can't speak for my parents, but I think they thought that if we could just kept talking about it eventually, we would realise that that was the only way forward. And so for a few months, it kind of was this thing where I was in Melbourne and they were in Canberra. We'd have these conversations occasionally and we'd try and see each other and, you know, work it out. And then I moved back to Canberra. And at that point, when Chris and I were living together in Canberra and it was much harder to kind of put that distance between us And the reality of how we were living and what my parents wanted for us, at that point, it all all just kind of broke down and we went into a period of of not really talking to each other. How scary was that period for you? Initially, I actually felt almost like giddy with relief because it was this thing that I'd been dreading so much and then it happened and then I had nothing to dread anymore. So there was this kind of a couple of weeks where I was almost euphoric, like it felt really odd. And then I just went into quite a significant depression. So again, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. I, you know, lost a bunch of weight and I tried to see a therapist that wasn't really working for me. And it was all happening at the same time as Chris and I, as graduates, trying to find work and, you know, struggling to find good jobs and figuring out who we were as adults. So it was a really, really tough time. And did you doubt your decision, that sort of boundary that you'd you'd set so strongly? I think by that point, I had realised that even if it hadn't been for Chris, it would have had to have happened for me to live the type of life that I wanted to live. And the level of independence that I wanted and the ability to kind of live true to myself, that was always going to have to be at the cost of my family's expectations because the two things just wouldn't reconcile um, unless they completely changed their own attitudes, right? So... I knew that it had to happen in some way and that it was always going to be a big kind of chasm between us until or if we could find a way through it. So I didn't regret anything, but I did feel quite hopeless. Um, I felt very alone in that period because Mm -hmm. our family was so tight-knit and to suddenly not have them as part of my life just felt completely wrong. How did things change? So my dad stayed in touch on and off. We would occasionally see each other. I'd get emails and things like that um, from him. But, you know, the conversation always kept revolving around, when will you get married? You just need to do a Muslim nikah and then this will all be better. Whereas my mum and I hadn't spoken at all. But then her birthday rolled around and I always thought, you know, I'm not the kind of person who would ever miss my mother's birthday. So I posted her a little present and a card And she texted me when she got it. And we started seeing each other for coffee dates and kind of trying to build a relationship back up. And for the first little while, it was awkward, but also such a relief to be just in her presence again, because I've always been close to my mum. And I guess from there, it was just taking these really small steps forward until eventually they, you know, met with Chris and he started coming to the family dinners and things like that. And What were those early interactions between Chris and, and your family like? And what was it like for you to, to be observing them? Oh, I was a wreck. <laughs> um, I just remember, you know, driving up to my parents' house with Chris the first time and giving him these strict instructions like, you know, you need to take your shoes off at the door because we don't wear shoes inside and don't sit next to me or touch me because we don't do any physical affection, like romantic physical affection in other people's presence. You know, just be really polite. And I don't know why I thought I needed to give him this instruction because he's such a polite, kind person. So in fact, everything went much better than I could have expected. Um, But I was just like, something terrible is going to happen. Someone's going to say something and offend the other party or something like that will inevitably derail this situation. And instead, he just fit in really nicely. And by the time we'd been 
together for, you know, four or five years. He'd been seeing the family for at least kind of a year or so and just started becoming part of the family. And I think it's it's really important to note how much of a concession that was for my parents because the community probably still judged, you know, my relationship and my decision to live in sin and, and not practice Islam. But my parents made the decision then that it was more important that they had a relationship with me and that they would do whatever it took to kind of have that regardless of what their religion said and regardless of what their culture said. Have you heard from many other Muslim people, young people in sort of similar situations to you, Zoya? Like, is is your story a common one? It's funny that you say this because literally this weekend I've been messaging backwards and forwards with a girl about this exact situation. And this happens quite a lot because I've written now extensively about my life and, and this experience in particular. And as a result of that, I find that quite a lot of people have contacted me to talk about their own issues with interracial relationships. And I'm I'm talking people from all kinds of places, you know, America, Canada, the UK. I had a Swedish guy contact me recently. This girl is Jordanian and she's contacted me. It happens a lot. And it reminds me of when I was going through this initially and I was Googling like, how to tell Indian parents about white boyfriend. (laughs) And there was nothing, right? Like there was a Yahoo Answers thread um, (laughs) that I read religiously. And it really made me think like this is, there are lots of people experiencing this kind of conundrum and no one knows how to approach it. And I just wanted someone to say, hey, I've done this and it was okay. You've become the poster girl. What, What advice do you give then? I mostly just try and listen. I think it's about knowing what your boundaries are and and kind of navigating those together. And that's what I try and and say to these people who contact me is, you know, the most important thing is that you're being true to yourself and that you're just being really honest because being honest is the only reason why I have a good relationship with my family now, even though, you know, there was an initial period of secrecy, which um, I don't know how I could have gotten around that. Everything else has been as open as I can be. And I think... There's a bit of mutual respect that builds when you treat people with that honesty. During that period, that really difficult period of estrangement from your family, how did horses come back into your life? Well, the first thing I did when I was feeling at my absolute lowest was um, bully Chris into adopting a cat because <laughs> I knew that I needed an animal in my life. <laughs> I just felt like I wanted to nurture something. It was your something. gateway drug into the it's large animal. Drug. <laughs> it's just a yeah. cat. Yeah, well, I started slow, yeah. I said, it's just a cat. And he was like, but we want to live overseas. And I was like, oh, I've researched it. We can take her with us. Um, and you know, spoiler alert, we did take our rescue cat to Scotland for a year. Um, she is now <laughs> worth her weight in gold. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> no, she was not appreciative. She's still she's still salty about that. Um, and then one day we were driving and I saw horses in a field and I just suddenly turned to Chris and said, I wonder if I should try horse riding again. And bless him, having no idea what would happen, he was like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. You should definitely do that. Um, and so off I went, I researched and I found a riding centre that did adult riding lessons. And it was important to me to not go back to the place that I'd been before because I didn't have good memories. And I had no idea what to expect, you know, rocking up to this new riding school, but they were amazing. And from the moment I showed up for my first lesson, it was just really inclusive and a really just positive environment. And I just became a full-blown addict again. And did (laughs) you feel at home in the saddle right away? You know, all of this muscle memory suddenly came back to me. Like I got on this horse and there are all these little things that you learn over the course of riding. Like, um, you know, when you're doing a trot, you rise with the beat of the horse and you rise in time with the outside leg going forward or the outside shoulder going forward. And I started trotting and I was like, oh, I need to rise with the outside shoulder. Like all these things just started kind of popping back into my memory. And I was able to kind of walk, trot and canter in that first lesson back. And from the moment I felt that movement again and I, you know, I stroked the horse and I um, had the moment afterwards where he put his little head towards me and I just had this sense of homecoming um, and I knew that I had to, I just had to have that back in my life. Well, when you were a younger rider, you didn't have your own horse. When did you first then actually get a horse of your own, Zoya? So we lived in Scotland for about a year and at that time I'd been riding weekly at the riding school for about three or four years. Um, And when I came back from Scotland, I'd ridden while I was over in Scotland too and made some wonderful horsey friends and kind of shared a horse with somebody else, um, which is a more common thing to do in the UK than over here. 
I came back and I just wanted my own. But I also came back with virtually no money because um, <laughs> I had not worked. Cat. <laughs> cranky cat who we had spent way too much money bringing back to Australia. And I started looking at horses with the help of um, my friends from this riding school. And I was like, oh, this is going to be more expensive than I thought. And so I sat down with my parents and I said, hey, guys, um, would you loan me this money? And here is a payment plan of how I would pay you back because, you know, I've got this job now and this is how much I can save and blah, blah, blah. And they said, okay, look, go find the horse that you want. We'll talk about this. And then a Facebook ad came up for this mare down in Victoria. And at the time, there just weren't a lot of horses on the market. And my coach sent her to me and said, you need to go see this horse tomorrow. Um, and I was like, oh, she's six hours away, but okay. Um, so Chris jumped in the car with me and we drove six hours down to Victoria and met this horse and she trotted up to me in the paddock and I was just smitten. Um, and everything about her was unsuitable. <laughs> like unsuitable. I could barely ride her. Oh my goodness. I went into this relationship with this mare, Penny. Her name is Penny Lane. Um, and I thought, oh, what a whimsical, beautiful name, the Beatles. You know, I had a vision in my head of this really sweet natured, you know, she's a Clydesdale cross, this gentle giant. That is not Penny. The first time I got on her after she arrived, she wouldn't even move forward. Um, she was like, no, nope, make me. And I couldn't. Um, and I was like, what have I done? Like, I literally can't even make this horse move. She seems to really dislike me. Like she, this is a horse who has her ears back, which is a sign of anger a lot of the time or dominance from the from the moment she would see me. I could literally, if I stepped forward, her ears would go back. If I stepped backwards away from her, her ears would go forward. Um, and I was like, I don't, I don't know that this is going to work. But I have had her now for six years and we went through some real ups and downs, but I love that horse with all my heart and I will have her forever. And my mum gave me the money. And when I tried to pay her back, she said, Zoya, I always wanted to be able to buy you a horse and we could never afford it when you were a kid. So please, now I can. And I just want you to have have her. Um, so don't pay me back. So yeah, last laugh, she bought my horse for me at 28. <laughs> She's not the only horse you have though. No, things escalated pretty drastically. Um, I have three now. When COVID happened, um, I think I went a little bit crazy and where everybody else was getting, you know, COVID dogs, I went and bought a COVID foal. <laughs> so I saw this little, this, another sassy little mare trotting along in a Facebook video and I just saw this horse and she was so fancy and so pretty. And next thing you knew, I had bought a warm blood filly. Her name is Lola and she is with me now. I've had her for since she was six months old and she's a giant. She's a massive, massive horse and I am a small woman. So <laughs> again, I don't think I made a good decision, um, but I, I love her and she's just started her ridden journey now. So I haven't actually been able to ride her because I was pregnant when she was started under saddle, but I'm going to ride her in a month or so and I can't wait. Um, and then two should have been enough, but the opportunity came up to purchase my coach's horse. So I had gotten into show jumping and I wanted to get into eventing, which is where you do dressage, show jumping and cross country, which is the most exciting part. You gallop across these long distances and you jump obstacles and the adrenaline of it really got to me. But Penny is not a brave horse and I was just falling off her, like constantly trying to do this. Um, so she'd just stop and I'd fly off. And my jump coach, her name is Hannah Klepp. She's this amazing, really talented young rider from Canberra. And she had this horse that she had had since he was a race horse. And she was a teenager and she trained him all the way up. At this point, she wanted to retire him from that high level competition. And she wanted a really good home for him. Um, someone who would take care of everything that he needed because he raced for so many years and then he competed at this high level. He needed all that love. And, um, Again, I sat down with Chris and I was like, I know that this is not <laughs> what you thought would happen, but I think I'm going to get a third horse. <laughs> and so I bought Reprieve and I remember texting my dad and telling him, and I said, look, I know it's not a smart financial decision. Um, and he said, if you wanted to make smart financial decisions, you wouldn't have any horses, but you love them and that's all that matters. So, <laughs> you know, go live your life. And so now I have three. Yeah. So is this it? Is three the, the limit? I've said that I have a one in one out policy now, so someone has to die before I get another horse. Um, <laughs> but um, no, my goal is to downsize um, over time. These three will be with me forever. But I tell Lola, because she's so young, I say, you're my last horse because you should live for another 20 years. And surely <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> um, they are absolutely far too expensive and they take up all my time, but I love them so much. And it yeah, even as you're saying that, I hear the joy and delight that you have in them. You know, there's there's no bitterness or recrimination. There is just celebration of these animals. 
No. And even, you know, last year I was pregnant and I really struggled with not riding. I rode until I was about six months. Um, and then I just had to stop because I was too big and it was uncomfortable. And what I found kept me sane was actually going and doing all the chores. So, you know, I'd be in the paddock with a wheelbarrow picking up poo and heaving it. And everybody was saying to me, Zoya, please stop. You know, you're very pregnant. And I eventually conceded that I couldn't lift the hay bales anymore. And Chris was coming out and doing all these chores for me. But I had to see them every day. I just can't go through a day without seeing them. Hmm. How has becoming a mother changed things with your parents? Or has it led to you reflecting in any further way about you know, the the relationship between you and them and how it's changed over the years. You know, it's really funny. When I was in hospital with my um my son, he came six weeks early. So we spent a bit of time in the hospital. And as much as I've like been very open with my parents about everything, there are some things I still tried to hide. And one of those was um, my tattoos because they would hate tattoos and I would cover them up. And I don't know who I thought I was fooling. I'm sure they've seen them. They're on my arm. So they're pretty um, easily seen. And I was constantly trying to hide them. And then when I had the baby, my dad was coming to visit me. And I remember thinking, you know, it was really hot. It was right after Christmas. And I was like, Soya, you now have a child. You can't act like a child. Stop trying to hide your tattoos. You know, just be yourself. Um, and so they were on display and I saw my dad come in and he, he looked at each of them and then he just didn't say anything. And I turned around to Chris later and I said, if I had known that the way to get unconditional approval was to just have a baby, because now it's like, you know, I'm the key to the baby. So I feel like I could do no wrong. Um, and they love him and Chris's family love my son as well. And it, he's just become this source of immense joy for everyone. So I feel as though it's kind of clarified why we found our way back to each other as a family because family is just very important. And having my son has made me realise just how impossible that love is that you have for a child and, and how hard it must be when you have an idea of what's right, but you also just love your child um, and you you want what's best for them. And it's very scary and it's it must just be very hard as they get older. I'm dreading it already. You know, right now my son can't make a lot of decisions for himself. So it's, it's pretty easy, but I can, I can understand my parents a lot better now, I think. And I think that understanding is going to grow as my kid grows. I'm so happy to hear the way it's worked out for you and your parents and Chris and your bub and those horses. Thank you, Zoya, for being my guest on Conversations. Thank you so much. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Sarah Kanoski. For more Conversations interviews, head to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.